Welcome back to Durban. I've said that I think seven times in the past week as I've had the great privilege of introducing the daily Coppuccino, which has been brought to a variety of websites around the world by University of Cambridge and Nedbank, our main sponsors for this event. It's been great fun. It's been extremely hot in Durban. There's been this sort of paraphernalia and carnival of meetings. And what we've done is plucked people from their daily business in the COP, in the broad COP, and we've asked them about why they were here, what they've been trying to achieve, what their expectations were, who they've been talking to. We've asked them what their most significant moment was. And I think we've managed to gauge the temperature of COP17. Uh, this is Emagora. It's first of all a place where there's a lot of thinking and a lot of advertising and a lot of uh, uh, thought leadership. Uh, there's a lot of media and messages about climate change and putting climate change on the agenda. I think the message in the corridors is nobody wants to see Kyoto Protocol die in Durban. Nobody wants to see that happen on African soil. And that is the consensus. What is being done in the building there um, must ultimately have not, a, sorry, must have as, as its objective not just to get an agreement. That's the wrong objective but to get an agreement that deals with the climate problem. That's the objective. So there's a part of me that goes, you know, so what about Kyoto and all these other elements? The point is, are we really progressing along the road towards an ultimate agreement that deals with the climate problem in a way that is scientifically based and the strong consensus, the strong agreement, people will stick to that agreement. Um, it's been interesting, uh, the kind of growing acceptance amongst developing countries uh, that they too need to be part of a comprehensive, globally binding deal uh, or agreement in the future. So that has shifted quite substantially from previous COPs where you had the polarized view of the developed countries, of course, and they have to, have to lead, historical responsibility, um, all of those issues at play. But in this COP, They've come into this COP, it seems, with a growing sense that developing countries would have to also take responsibility and consider taking those responsibilities in a legally binding way. I think in life we, we need leadership and people look to the formality of agreements, which is why in the UN system you've got these endless negotiations. But unless you've got the formality of agreements, you're asking the private sector to commit resources to something that uh, is, is completely unclear because, you know, it's just in the nature of the beast. We know where we've been. We don't know where we're going to. And ensure that, that, that we can raise the quality of life of people uh, is the big, big challenge. I feel whether it's individual companies or governments moving ahead, they are both moving ahead often in the absence of this global agreement. So it's starting to become a money issue uh, that the reason that we should move ahead uh, is because of the money yeah. and ironically the reason that we refuse to move ahead is because, is of, because the of the money. Yeah. I, I fully agree and, and I think that um, we need to monetize the vision unfortunately because of the way in which we are struggling with the recession we're forced to do so but I think there's a way that we can create that vision by monetizing it. So I think one of the things is actually there's no shortage of capital in the world. There's a lot of capital sitting on the lines and I think people are willing to deploy it. But what we're looking for policymakers is some sort of uh, what we call investment grade policy so you can allocate capital with some degree of surety. We don't have consistent reporting standards and it's incredibly labor intensive to go through and actually understand what are people spending this climate finance money on, who's benefiting from it, and what, do, what does it mean at the end of the day for tons of greenhouse gas emissions reduced and, and for adaptation benefits and resilience enhancements delivered. The, the, the scientific community is now seriously thinking of plan B. You know, it's, 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 it's not obvious that the world will get plan A right. Plan is plan A over 2%? What is plan? Oh, no, plan A is let's mitigate the change and keep it below, you know, a three degree level or, or, or something like that. Uh, it's not clear that that will happen in time. Plan B is what if we miss that target? What if we heading for six degrees? Then what do we do? And that's where it gets really scary. Our difficulty is if business cannot move as fast as our children's and grandchildren's interests tell us we need to move, then we have no ethical option but to keep also strong pressure on, uh, on companies. And I regret the most not pushing harder. 
you can do business in a different way. Uh, we looked at all aspects of how we do business. And it was really only when we started to pull them all together as one single good business journey that everybody in the organization and our supplier base upstream, uh, what you call our supply chain, that everybody's eyes lit up because everybody could do something that they felt passionate about. Go and construct any index based on the sustainability of companies and that index will outperform the market. It, you see it time after time. NetBank's just recently done it and found the same thing, that the green companies are the ones making more money than the others. Um, and that's coming to a point for governments as well. I, I would love to see the United States and China and India and all the other countries sign an agreement that and put $100 billion a year into uh, protecting the climate and, and start seeing groups of six, five, seven nations coming together and setting up uh, really functional uh, networks, almost trading blocks to work on red and on other issues. And I think that that's where we're headed. We're headed towards uh, that kind of engagement. We're all working very hard. Even in the worst of all cases, which won't happen, but even in the worst of all cases, even if Durban, you know, says, oh man, no agreement on, I don't know, the Green Climate Fund or the Adaptation Committee or whatever. That does not mean that we have failed the next generation. We have to understand that this problem has been created over decades. And this problem is going to take, unfortunately, it's going to take years to solve. This is not, if this were easy, we would have solved it a long time ago. This is complex. This is very complex. But I have not heard a single government, a single government that says, it's too complex, we're walking away. None of them. They're saying it's complex, we're staying here, we are talking to each other, we're sometimes fighting with each other, absolutely. That's what it's all about. But nobody is walking away.